extraordinary, unfamiliar states of consciousness, misapprehensions of natural phenomena and mental illness. No contemporary religion and no New Age belief seems to me to take sufficient account of the grandeur, magnificence, subtlety and intricacy of the universe revealed by science. The fact that so little of the findings of modern science is prefigured in scripture, to my mind, casts further doubt on its divine inspiration. But of course I might be wrong. At a dinner many decades ago, the physicist Robert W. Wood was asked to respond to the toast to physics and metaphysics. By metaphysics, people then meant something like philosophy, or truths you could recognize just by thinking about them. They could also have included pseudoscience. Wood answered along these lines. The physicist has an idea. The more he thinks it through, the more sense it seems to make. He consults the scientific literature. The more he reads, the more promising the idea becomes. Thus prepared, he goes to the laboratory and devises an experiment to test it. The experiment is painstaking. Many possibilities are checked. The accuracy of measurement is refined. The error bars reduced. He lets the chips fall where they may. He is devoted only to what the experiment teaches. At the end of all this work, through careful experimentation, the idea is found to be worthless. So the physicist discards it frees his mind from the clutter of error, and moves on to something else. The difference between physics and metaphysics, Wood concluded as he raised his glass high, is not that the practitioners of one are smarter than the practitioners of the other. The difference is that the metaphysicist has no laboratory. For me, there are four main reasons for a concerted effort to convey science in radio, TV, movies, newspapers, books, computer programs, theme parks and classrooms, to every citizen. In all uses of science, it is insufficient, indeed it is dangerous, to produce only a small, highly competent, well-rewarded priesthood of professionals. Instead, some fundamental understanding of the findings and methods of science must be available on the broadest scale. Despite plentiful opportunities for misuse, science can be the golden road out of poverty and backwardness for emerging nations. It makes national economies and the global civilization run. Many nations understand this. It is why so many graduate students in science and engineering at American universities, still the best in the world, are from other countries. The corollary, one that the United States sometimes fails to grasp, is that abandoning science is the road back into poverty and backwardness. Science alerts us to the perils introduced by our world-altering technologies, especially to the global environment on which our lives depend. Science provides an essential early warning system. Science teaches us about the deepest issues of origins, natures, and fates, of our species, of life, of our planet, of the universe. For the first time in human history, we are able to secure a real understanding of some of these matters. Every culture on Earth has addressed such issues and valued their importance. All of us feel goosebumps when we approach these grand questions. In the long run, the greatest gift of science may be in teaching us, in ways no other human endeavor has been able, something about our cosmic context, about where, when, and who we are. The values of science and the values of democracy are concordant, in many cases indistinguishable. Science and democracy began, in their civilized incarnations, in the same time and place, Greece in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. Science confers power on anyone who takes the trouble to learn it, although too many have been systematically prevented from doing so. Science thrives on, indeed requires, the free exchange of ideas. Its values are antithetical to secrecy. Science holds to no special vantage points or privileged positions. Both science and democracy encourage unconventional opinions and vigorous debate. Both demand adequate reason, coherent argument, rigorous standards of evidence and honesty. Science is a way to call the bluff of those who only pretend to knowledge. It is a bulwark against mysticism, against superstition, against religion misapplied to where it has no business being. If we're true to its values, it can tell us when we're being lied to. It provides a mid-course correction to our mistakes. The more widespread its language, rules and methods, the better chance we have of preserving what Thomas Jefferson and his colleagues had in mind. But democracy can also be subverted more thoroughly through the products of science than any pre-industrial demagogue ever dreamed. Finding the occasional straw of truth awash in a great ocean of confusion and bamboozle requires vigilance, dedication, and courage. But if we don't practice these tough habits of thought, 
we cannot hope to solve the truly serious problems that face us, and we risk becoming a nation of suckers, a world of suckers, up for grabs by the next charlatan who saunters along. An extraterrestrial being, newly arrived on Earth, scrutinizing what we mainly present to our children in television, radio, movies, newspapers, magazines, the comics, and many books, might easily conclude that we are intent on teaching them murder, rape, cruelty, superstition, credulity, and consumerism. We keep at it, and through constant repetition, many of them finally get it. What kind of society could we create if, instead, we drummed into them science and a sense of hope? My parents died years ago. I was very close to them. I still miss them terribly. I know I always will. I long to believe that their essence, their personalities, what I loved so much about them, are, really and truly, still in existence somewhere. I wouldn't ask very much, just five or ten minutes a year, say, to tell them about their grandchildren, to catch them up on the latest news, to remind them that I love them. There's a part of me, no matter how childish it sounds, that wonders how they are. Is everything all right? I want to ask. The last words I found myself saying to my father at the moment of his death were, take care. Sometimes I dream that I'm talking to my parents, and suddenly, still immersed in the dream work, I'm seized by the overpowering realization that they didn't really die, that it's all been some kind of horrible mistake. Why, here they are, alive and well, my father making wry jokes, my mother earnestly advising me to wear a muffler because the weather is chilly. When I wake up, I go through an abbreviated process of mourning all over again. Plainly, there's something within me that's ready to believe in life after death. And it's not the least bit interested in whether there's any sober evidence for it. So I don't before at the woman who visits her husband's grave and chats him up every now and then, maybe on the anniversary of his death. It's not hard to understand. And if I have difficulties with the ontological status of who she's talking to, that's all right. That's not what this is about. This is about humans being human. But that doesn't mean I'd be willing to accept the pretensions of a medium who claims to channel the spirits of the dear departed when I'm aware the practice is rife with fraud. I know how much I want to believe that my parents have just abandoned the husks of their bodies, like insects or snakes molting, and gone somewhere else. I understand that those very feelings might make me easy prey even for an unclever con, or for normal people unfamiliar with their unconscious minds or for those suffering from a dissociative psychiatric disorder. Reluctantly, I rouse some reserves of skepticism. How is it, I ask myself, that channelers never give us verifiable information otherwise unavailable? Why does Alexander the Great never tell us about the exact location of his tomb, Fermat about his last theorem, John Wilkes Booth about the Lincoln assassination conspiracy, Hermann Goering about the Reichstag fire? Why don't Sophocles, Democritus, and Aristarchus dictate their lost books? Don't they wish future generations to have access to their masterpieces? If some good evidence for life after death were announced, I'd be eager to examine it. But it would have to be real scientific data, not mere anecdote. As with the face on Mars and alien abductions, better the hard truth, I say, than the comforting fantasy. And in the final tolling, it often turns out that the facts are more comforting than the fantasy. Distraught cancer victims make pilgrimages to the Philippines where psychic surgeons, having palmed bits of chicken liver or goat heart, pretend to reach into the patient's innards and withdraw the diseased tissue, which is then triumphantly displayed. Under public pressure for results, police with an unsolved murder or a missing body on their hands consult ESP experts, who never guess better than expected by common sense, but the police, the ESPers say, keep calling. A clairvoyance gap with adversary nations is announced, and the Central Intelligence Agency, under congressional prodding, spends tax money to find out whether submarines in the ocean depths can be located by thinking hard at them. A psychic, using pendulums over maps and dousing rods in airplanes, purports to find new mineral deposits. An Australian mining company pays him top dollar up front, none of it returnable in the event of failure, and a share in the exploitation of ores in the event of success nothing is discovered. Statues of Jesus or murals of Mary are spotted with moisture, and thousands of kind-hearted people convince themselves that they have witnessed a miracle. These are all cases of proved or presumptive baloney. A deception arises, sometimes innocently but collaboratively, sometimes with cynical premeditation. Usually the victim is caught up in a powerful emotion, wonder, fear, greed, grief. Credulous acceptance